In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So uh, just reviewing, uh, we, uh, last night we were talking about how the word secret place that Jesus uses is some, something akin to like a, like a secret storage place, like a pantry or something, but not the one, not the one that you use all the time, but the one that supplies the one that you use all the time. Um, and we looked at the at the Greek word and, and what it means, and and then we kind of applied that to the to the ten virgins, the five wise, the five foolish, uh, and uh, we were talking about the difference between the two is is not that they were virgins; they were all virgins. It's not that they they some of them stayed awake. No, they all fell asleep. Um, but that some of them had some of them had more than enough. And that a lot of the time I feel like I'm, I have just enough to get by. And how God wants me to have more than enough. And my spiritual life is more than enough to supply for me and for my day. To give me peace. To give me contentment. To give me happiness. And these aren't false promises. They're real. They're very, very real. But the issue is that I, I run into the secret place. I get just enough to get me through the day. And off and off I go and off I go again. Right? And we were, we were saying like, you know, what does is, what is your storage place look like? Does it look, does it look like a, a bachelor's fridge like mine often look like? You know, it's just a few half used bottles of salad dressing and maybe some condiments. Or is it full or is it full to, over, full to overflowing? And, you know... Many different people have been attributed to this saying, Benjamin Franklin amongst some, if you, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. So if you've walked into this retreat thinking, yeah, I, you know, I would like to, to give my spiritual life a tune-up, and then and you sat through the first talk and you thought to yourself, yeah, I should, pr I should probably really try harder. Or someone in, you know, in one of the breaks was telling me, you know, when it all comes down to discipline, you know, I'm, tell I'm telling you this. If you don't walk out of this retreat with a plan, the chances that you're going to do anything different than what you've done is very small. And if you think that that's going to lead you to something different, well, you all, we all know that, you know, you do, you do the same, you end up with very much of the same, right? And we talked about, like, various different different things that can kind of contribute into a spiritual rule. And we talked just a little bit about that. But I really, I really want to put the emphasis, I really, really want to put the emphasis on that, like the second finding of this study that I shared. And, and like any other study, it has its limitations and, and has to be read within context and so on. But, but the researchers found that it's not just the number of friends that you have, and it's not whether or not you're in a committed relationship, but it's the quality of your close relationships that matters. And God wants to have a top quality close relationship with us. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that means, specifically, not just like, you know, not just in, 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 vague, in vague general terms. And I have to tell you, I rarely ever accept to speak about prayer for two reasons. One, I don't feel like I pray enough. I'm telling you the truth. I feel like I, I should pray at least, I'm, I'm being really honest with you, I'm not exaggerating, 10 times as much as I actually pray. So it's very convicting for me to read about this topic. It's very convicting for me to stand here, and it's very difficult, and I rely entirely on the grace of God. The second reason is because I, probably like you, have heard a lot of talk about prayer, but I'm still, I'm still not praying that much. So I want to address that. I want to address why. Why is there all this talk about prayer, but so much little, so little prayer actually happening? There's sermons and books and articles and blogs and podcasts, but how much do we actually pray? Uh, a friend of mine was uh, at uh, a medical missions conference in Kentucky with over 50,000 people there. And the keynote speaker was speaking about prayer, and he started off by asking the audience, he said, you know, before I get talking about prayer and mission, I want, to ask, I want to ask everybody a question, just show of hands, okay? Show of hands, how many people here pray for more than an hour a day? 
and like two people put up their hand of the 50,000. And he said, okay, how many people here pray for more than half an hour a day? And a handful of people put up their, their hands. He said, how many people here pray for more than 10 minutes a day? And um, about another couple of hundred people put up their hands. He said, how many people here pray for more than five minutes a day? And the majority of people put up their hands. So the majority of people, these are, these are long-term, most of them long-term, some of them short-term, overseas medical missionaries. These are people who have given up their life. They could be, you know, working in healthcare in, 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 um, in North America or in, or in Western Europe. They could be earning a good living. They've given it all of that up. These are good people, right? And they've gone to the mission field to go and to serve God and to bring the word of God to people who wouldn't have access to it and to bring health care and well-being to people who wouldn't have access to it. But somehow, prayer got lost somewhere in between. How does that happen? I have a few hypotheses. I mean, we're all, every, every one of us has our own answers. Some people say because when a prayer is so abstract, you know, so like you hear a talk and it, it kind of, somebody describes something to you and you kind of, you kind of listen and you say, okay, well, let me give that a whirl and you go home and you kind of try it, but nothing happens and you don't know if you're doing it right or you're doing it wrong or so you just kind of keep doing what you're doing and, or maybe a lot of us feel like we've tried and we failed. Like people talk about these ecstatic experiences in prayer and the, the cherubim and the seraphim and the heavens open and, you know, and I go to my prayer room and I pray and I stand there and I pray with all my heart. And, uh, well, you know, I still feel like I'm talking to the ceiling or, you know, or maybe, maybe you've prayed for a long time and you really believe and you've prayed for so long and you just feel like God hasn't answered you. There's a multitude of reasons why we may feel that God is not answering. And, you know, the conclusion that we, that we get to is that maybe I'm doing this wrong. And then you hear somebody tell you that, no, God accepts whatever you offer him. No, he doesn't. I'm going to tell you something. 90% of your objections to prayer are actually true. But they're the first part of a sentence. The devil loves doing this, okay? This is like spiritual warfare 101, right? Like you have to be able to recognize your enemy. So spiritual warfare 101, the devil loves this trick. This is like his, one of his first, first tricks. He tells you something which is true and no one can deny it. You prayed and you did not hear an answer from God. No one can deny it. You didn't like hear the heavens open, a bellowing voice, you know, nothing, you know? Even people talk about having this certainty in their heart, like they're sure God has spoken to them. You didn't even get that, nothing, right? And then he adds a thousand lies after it. So because the first thing was true, he gains our credibility, and then he can say whatever he wants, right? So it's true that not all worship is acceptable, and we're going to look at a few verses of that. What's, what's not said here, which is so important, it's probably the most important thing that we're going to talk about, is that it is God himself who invites us into prayer. In Amos, God says some really harsh words. He says, though you will offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. Oh, that's harsh. That's harsh. Why is God saying that? We'd have to read the context in Amos to see, to see that God was saying this at a time of idolatry, at a time when people were purposefully not paying attention to God. Like they knew, they weren't distracted. They were purposefully worshiping idols. When we, f when we have unrepented sin in our hearts, when we have when we have bitterness, when we have stubbornness, that's something that God really hates. God is a person, he's just as much as you and I are. He's, he's not a mathematical equation that, you know, like, you know, like A plus B equals C, one plus one will always equal two, you know. No, God, God is, uh, he, he has a personality. There's things he likes and there's things he doesn't. He hates stubbornness, absolutely hates it. 
You know what the, you know what the practical definition of a heretic is? We think like a heretic is somebody who says wrong teaching. That's not what our church teaches a heretic is. A heretic is someone who is divisive, arrogant, and unwilling to repent. So our church never judges someone who is deceased as a heretic or not a heretic. We can judge their teachings, but we can't judge the person. Because the defining characteristics of a heretic are, are personal characteristics. You have to offer the person an opportunity to repent for them and then, then them to refuse it. Jesus says something similar. He says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer the gift. So it's not, it's, it's, you're right. You're, you're right that if, if at times, at times I go to worship God and I'm not, I'm not in the right space. I'm jealous of my brother. I'm jealous of my sister. I'm angry with this person. I got I got to sort that out. But but don't let the devil fool you. It, God isn't turning you away. God is telling you, "Come, let's go sort that out." And then let's sing with the cherubim and the seraphim and all that stuff. He's saying he's not saying, "Okay, you go sort out your problem. You go sort out your jealousy. You go sort out your anger. You go sort out your bitterness. You go sort out your issue, and when you're done, you can come back to me." Jesus was incarnate and died on the cross because of his refusal to be apart from us. He's not going to let anything come between you and him. He's going to go with me and he's going to go with you to sort it out. St. Theophan says, prayer is the test of everything. Prayer is also the source of everything. Prayer is the driving force of everything. Prayer is also the director of everything. If prayer is right, everything is right. For prayer will not allow anything to go wrong. Look at the promise. He's not saying, if you pray, all things will go right. He's saying, if prayer is right, everything will be right. Because prayer is the source of everything. So, when you, when you feel like you're praying and you feel like, I feel like I'm doing this all wrong. I'm so sorry, maybe you are, right? Maybe you are doing it all wrong. Maybe I am doing it all wrong, right? But don't think that, like, okay, maybe I'm doing this all wrong, so God doesn't want to talk to me. God hates me. No. God wants to come and sort it out with me and sort it out with you and figure out why am I, why am I not in a space where I can really access my heart. I can really enter into my heart, into the kingdom of God, which is within me, and worship God who is there. Why not? St. Macarius says something so beautiful. I couldn't find the exact quote to, to put it in, so I didn't want to, you know, just write it myself in case I say something that's not quite right. But he says, he says this, In the heart of man is the kingdom of God, with all its angels and archangels and principalities and powers and cherubim and seraphim. All the glory of God is in, contained in this small vessel, the heart of man. And God is constantly inviting you and inviting me into that place. But to go there, I'm going to need to be alone with God. How long can you sit alone in a room by yourself without reaching for your phone, your iPad, your laptop, without thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow or how you're going to solve this problem at work or just being present, not being physically there, but mind elsewhere, just being present in that space. That's what we, that's what we all, myself included, need to come to so that we can enter into that kingdom, which is actually, which is actually just, just within us. So let's see what the saints have told us a little bit about what is prayer. Well, God himself says about prayer. He says, you have said, this is King David talking to God. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. God is telling us, seek my face. What does that mean? That means that, that prayer is not something that actually starts with me. 
Like when you say like, oh gosh, man, you know, like I attended this, this conference and it was really good and I really feel like I need to pray more. So I need to pull up my bootstraps and I got to do this, right? Scripture is telling us that prayer doesn't actually start with you. It actually starts with God inviting me and inviting you to go and to pray. It, it, it starts with me hearing God calling me. We believe grace, in, in, in our orthodox theology, we believe that grace is a three-part thing. God in, invites or God initiates, we respond, and our response is always kind of half-hearted. It's always impoverished. It's always like, nah, you know, kind of pathetic compared to the, 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 the invitation, you know. So God completes our response. He perfects, he perfects that which concerns me, Psalm 138. He perfects my response back. It's kind of a three-part thing, but it begins with God and it ends with God. But there's a, necessary, there's a necessary thing in there, which is I have to respond. Prayer is grace. What's grace? Grace is a free gift from God. Prayer is not something on my to-do list. It's not something that I've got to do today. It's a gift from God. God has, has given me a gift you know, I don't know what's a, what's a, you know, like a really fantastic sporting event. I don't know, the Super Bowl or the NBA Finals or, right, you know, and a friend of yours from high school you haven't talked to for 400 years calls you up and says, none of you were in high school 400 years ago, but you know what I mean, right? Nor was I, right? Uh, but you know what I mean, right? Somebody you haven't talked to in, in so long calls you up and says, hey, I have four tickets to this thing. I invited a friend. Why don't you invite a friend and come? And you're like, what? You're like, I want to see the, like, I want to see the ticket before I book my flight. You know, I want to, I want to hold it in my hand, you know, right? It's too, it's too good to be true, right? Prayer is an invitation from God for him to accompany us into his kingdom, which happens to be within us. It's not something I have to do. It's something he is inviting me to accompany him in doing. Prayer is a call and a response, says Father Matthew the Poor. Pope Shenouda says, prayer is communication, communication with God. But the, the point here, which is so critical, is that, that that communication starts with God. He is the one who initiates. He is the one who calls. He is the one who's asking. So don't worry. He's the one who started this project. He knows what he's doing. All we've got to do is follow the prompts. All we've got to do is follow follow the cues, say our lines. That's all we have to do. We don't have to write the script. We don't have to make the set. We don't have to, we just got, we just got to play our part. Father Matthew says, God thus appears as a benefactor every time we pray, for it is he as creator and as father who calls us to pray. Therefore, we should always begin our prayer with overflowing thanks. Oh, the humility of God who seeks to talk with us in spite of our sins. He goes on, but it was too much to put on the slide, but it's so beautiful, I can't resist. He says, for all things on earth, which are lovable and desirable, riches, glory, wife, children, in a word, everything that this world has that is beautiful, sweet, and attractive, belong, belong not to the soul, but only to the body, and thus are temporary, will pass away quickly as a shadow. But the soul, being eternal by its nature, can attain eternal rest only in the eternal God. He is its highest good, more perfect than all beauty, sweetness, and loveliness. And he is its natural home, whence it came and whither it must return. For as the flesh coming from the earth returns to the earth, so the soul coming from God returns to God and dwells with him. For the soul was created by God in order to dwell with him forever. Therefore, in this temporary life, we must diligently seek union with God in order to be accounted worthy to be with him and in him eternally in the future life. No unity with God is possible except by an exceeding great love. This we can see from the story of the woman in the gospel who was a sinner. 
God in his great mercy granted her forgiveness of her sins and a firm union with him, for she loved much. He loves those who love him. He cleaves to those who cleave to him, gives himself to those who seek him, and abundantly grafts, grants fullness of joy to those who desire to enjoy his love. I couldn't help, but like, I put this and I was like, this is enough. And then I was like, no, wait a minute. Like God loves us so much and he wants to give us so much. And the things that we seek after the most desperately are oftentimes counterfeits of the things which God wishes to give us. But that's a topic for another day. I'm just going to leave it at that because if I get started with that, I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to leave prayer. We're going to go back to talking about spiritual warfare and temptation. But think about that. Think about it. I can't help myself. Think about it, right? <laughs> Honestly, right? Okay, this is, this is my, my conversation with myself every night. <sighs> You're so tired. You only have like five hours and you got to get up again. Like, you know, like our father, we all, let's like just get to bed and, you know. And then I'm like, yeah, I am really tired. And I'm like, okay, well, um, but no, I need to pray. And then, well, like I really need to pray about these things. For one, I don't know to do, but what to do about them. For two, there's nothing I can do about that. God has to do something about that. But he knows already. You don't need to. So I spend like the time I would have spent prayer, of course, having this conversation about whether I should pray or shouldn't pray, right? And, and the ultimate premise upon which all of this is based is that I need to sleep so that I can be functional tomorrow, right? But here's a question for you, okay? Multiple choice question. Is it, are we after sleep or are we after rest? Okay, to illustrate this question, to illustrate this question, suppose you only have the option of two things. One, to sleep endlessly, but always wake up just as tired, if not more tired than you were before. Or two, to never need to sleep and always be 100% rested, 100% focused, and 100% ready to go. What would you prefer? Sleep as much as you want, you're always gonna be tired, or never need to sleep because you're 100% rested all the time. Option B, obviously. Right? Option B, obviously. You know why little kids don't want to sleep? It's because they're high on life, you know? All they, and I mean, come on, all they have to do is play, right? Like their job description for everything is just play, right? They wake up thinking, what are they going to play? They don't like to eat because that's an interruption to playing. I mean, obviously, right? They don't have to pay the bills. They don't have to cook the food and try to feed it to somebody. They don't have to, right? They don't have to do any of that, right? So obviously, we can learn so much from little children, right? So they hate sleeping because it's an, it's an interruption to playing. It's part of the fall. This, this thing called tiredness is part of, it's part of our fall. And that's why we see like really holy people don't sleep that much. But then I try to imitate them. <laughs> I'm just tired and grumpy all the time, <laughs> right? You know, right? Because I'm not that holy. Because stuff does irk me and bother me, and I do need time to, to, to reflect, to pray, to examine myself, to repent, to ask for God to heal me, and then to go back out there again, right? But it's actually rest we're after, not sleep. But the devil's always trying to sell us sleep. Why? Because he doesn't sell rest. He doesn't have that. Who has the monopoly on rest? Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Rest comes from God. Sleep comes from wherever you can find it. But my number one reason why I can't pray this evening is because I need to sleep. But I don't need to sleep. See, it's a counterfeit. It's something I'm getting sold instead of something else. And it looks like, but it isn't. And how many of us here have slept and woke up tired? I'm sure all of us, I'm sure it's happened to you. It happens to me all the time, right? Maybe what I need more of is going to Jesus who gives rest. Anyways, enough on the counterfeit thing. You can apply that to everything. You can apply it to food, to, to pleasures of the flesh, all kinds of things. They're all counterfeits. Anyways, back to prayer. There's two kinds of prayer, just in general, internal and external. As humans, we're dual. You know, we, we have a body and we have a soul. Uh, you know, I'm not a theologian, so, you know, don't like, you know, yes, we have a spirit as well and so on, but material and non-material and so on, right? So everything we do is going to exist on, on both of those spheres. That's normal. That's okay. That's a gift from God, right? The problem is when prayer exists only on the external plane and not on the internal plane. And God wants us 
to start somewhere and for it to lead somewhere else. God wants our souls, our spirits to lead our bodies and not the other way around. There's also sort of three deepening degrees of prayer, physical, mental, and then prayer of the heart. And these will manifest themselves internally and externally. And that's okay. None of this is None of this is wrong. Like I was saying yesterday, I don't think Jesus is against a whole bunch of stuff. I think he wants to lead us progressively from one step to the next to bring us into the kingdom. Prayer can be communal versus it can be in solitude. It could be together with lots of people. It could be, you can be alone. It can be said or it can be sung. It can be prescribed or it could be open prayer, free prayer. So it could be prescribed means have, was written out beforehand. So it's, it's, a, it's a text, it's, it, was, it was thought out and planned, somebody, somebody wrote it. And a lot of the time when we are faced with prescribed prayers, oftentimes we feel most people say things like, but these aren't my words. We're going to talk about that. You're right, they're not your words, right? And people say, well, one day they will become your words. They may or they may not, but you're right, they're not your words. But so how do we, how do we deal with that? There's basically, basically, you know, and this is my this is my own like my own slide. Like I didn't get this from some textbook of prayer or anything. There's just just kind of like you know my little concoction. There's there's about these kind of ten different forms of prayer, and we're not going to talk about all of them, but we're going to talk about some of them. The hours, uh, you know, in in other churches called the offices, we call it the igbeya. Igbeya is a Greek uh, is a Coptic word for hours. The Jesus prayer, open prayer, prostration, psalmody, liturgical prayer, singing, hymns, scriptural prayer, and charitable works. We're not going to talk about all of them, but we'll talk about a bunch of them. But the point is, is that these are kind of like, they're kind of like different food groups. That all of us benefit very much for having a lot of them in our life, right? Or another way of thinking about it is they're kind of like tools on a tool belt. There will be times in my life where one form of prayer will engage me and, and help me so much more than another. That's okay. But if I'm completely unfamiliar with that form of prayer that would be helpful to me at that time in my life, I'm not doing myself a favor, right? And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through, as we go through a few of them. So let's just start with the hours because that's kind of like sort of like foundational prayer in, in the Coptic Orthodox Church and, and in, our, in, our, in our lives, right? The hours, the hours are an adaptation of, or, or, or the glorification of Old Testament worship. You'll find several times in scripture, it says that there was, there was prayer, you know, at certain hours in the temple. And in, in, the, in the beginning of the book of Acts, St. John and St. Peter are going up to the temple at the third hour and they meet the man who was, who was lame begging at the door of the temple. So even the apostles respected, respected the hours. And historically, the, praying, praying the hours goes back to the very, to the very early church. And there's, there's, there's a couple of principles about, about the hours, okay, or about the Igbeya. And I'm just going to talk about those briefly and then we'll move on. The first one is, you'll notice that every three hours, there are set prayers. So that's something really useful to have in my spiritual life. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter like whether it's the hour specifically, I mean, it's, that's ideal, but you know, depending on your, your, your job, your life, what you do, that may or may not be possible. But what is, the point is, is that I don't kind of like meet with God in the morning and have this euphoric spiritual experience in the morning, forget about him all day and then remember him again in the evening. No, there's like these intermittent pauses, like the it's not an express train that starts from, you know, it's, it's origin and ends at the terminal. It's like a train that stops every few hours and checks in with God and reviews with God. And this happened in my day. And, and, and my boss I, I had this conversation with me and this person that I'm working with and, you know, and so it, it, it kind of, it, it organizes our life in such a way that we are intermittently, at, at the very least, if we're not going to pray without ceasing, at least we're intermittently, we're checking in with God. So that's one aspect of the hours that is often neglected, 
right? And that you may not feel like you're at, you're at a place or your spiritual father may or may not feel like you're at a place where you can start praying the Igbeya cover to cover. That's fine. But ask your spiritual father, do you, think, do you think I can make a couple of five minute pauses in the middle of my day? I can set an alarm on my phone at, at, at like 11, you know, 11 a.m. Or, 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 or at lunch and like at 2.30 or something and just stop and raise my heart to heaven and, and ask God for his mercy. Or just pray the prayer of thanksgiving. It'll take you 45 seconds, you know. You can, we can all do that like sitting at our desk or, you know. So that's one aspect of the, of the hours which is often forgotten and a very simple spiritual practice which, which all of us can take up. Another, another thing about the hours is, like, there's so much that can be said, but I'm, I'm going to limit myself to the second comment, is a lot of people when they come to pray the hours say, yeah, Buna, but they're not my words. Like, I just feel like they're not my words. And I can tell you a thousand answers of why we should still pray the hours, even if we feel like they're not our words. But I'm not going to. I'm just going to agree with you. You're right. They're not your words. So whose words are they? Who, 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 who wrote them? Well, you know, the, the psalmists, King David and the others, right? But like, but who authored them? Not like, you know, you know, who inspired them? The Holy Spirit. So whose words are they? They're actually God's words. So have you ever been to a prayer meeting where somebody is praying for something out loud and everybody else is in agreement? What do they do? They say, amen. They, they lend their support. They say, here, here. They say, yes, I'm with you, right? Okay, keep that thought. Another thought. Have you ever had an experience where you wanted to pray, but you just didn't have the strength to? I'm really, really lucky that I have an excellent sister. And growing up, I was a really moody teenager. Some people would argue that I'm still a really moody teenager. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'd wake up and I'd be on the wrong side of the bed that day and I'd just be upset and angry and frustrated and this and that. My sister would tell me, well, why don't we pray about it? Why don't you pray about it? I'd be like, I don't want to. She's like, really? You don't want to? She'd say, I tell her, no, I just don't, I just don't have it in me, okay? Like, just leave me alone. She said, okay, I'll tell you what, you don't have to pray. And she'd take me by the hand and go kneel by my bedside and hence drag me down to kneel beside her. And then she would pray, but she would pray using my words. She'd say, God, I don't know what I'm upset about. I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of great things I could do today, but I'm probably not gonna do any of them. I'm just gonna mope around the house and be upset and, be, and make everybody else upset. And I'm gonna waste, I'm gonna waste this great day. And you've given me this gift and I'm going to make nothing of it. And then I'm going to feel bad about the fact that I made nothing of it, right? And she would pray like that in my words, you know? And honestly, I feel like she's just carrying me. Like, I just don't have it in me. But she's kind of just like carrying me up to God so he can kind of give me a tune-up. Most of the time it would work. Remember, remember yesterday I was telling you, Jesus always comes to us when we're beginners in something as the poor man. He never comes to us as like the world authority expert. He always comes to the Samaritan woman as the man who's thirsty and needs a drink. To Zacchaeus, the plate, I, I, I need somewhere to have dinner. You know, to, to, to St. Mark and his family as, you know, I need somewhere to have, to, to have the Passover and so on, Right? Jesus comes to us in prayer as the poor man and says, I wish to say these words. Can you say them with me? Can you say them with me? Would you be willing? Would you be willing to set aside your thoughts, your prayers? I mean, and you can still say them. There's nothing wrong with that. We'll talk about that in a minute. But can you, can you pray with me? Suppose I have a problem and you have a completely different problem and you say, we're talking about it and we both agree we should really pray about this. Okay, the best time to pray about this would be now. So you say, okay, let's just, we'll turn our phones off for a minute and we'll pray, right? So we're not going to pray at the same time. That's going to be like just a lot of noise. Well, one of us will pray first and the other will pray second. So while you're praying about your issue, I'll be praying in my heart saying, Lord, please help him. Please stand with him. Lord, he needs help with this. He needs resolution with this. You know, neither of us know where to go with this, but you, Lord, you know, you have all the power and all the strength, and all, right? And I'm going to be praying in my heart while my friend is praying out loud. And I'm praying with him, for him, for what he's praying, right? Would you be willing to do that for Jesus? That's what praying the hours is.
in the art of prayer, there's a beautiful um, phrase, there's a beautiful thing about distraction. It says, anyone wishing to approach the Lord will first approach him by prayer. He begins to go to church and to pray at home with the help of a prayer book or without. But thoughts keep running away. He cannot manage to control them. All the same, the more he strives to pray, the more thoughts will quieten down. And the purer prayer will become. It's really simple. If I get distracted, just keep praying. You know, like you know you're on the right track. The saints have written to us about what to do when we get distracted. And they've told us, keep praying. That means that the saints get distracted in prayer. You're on the right track. Take it as an indication that you're on the right track. Just keep praying. One of the saints says, it says that it's a modern day saint says something kind of funny. He says, when I go to pray, I realize that my mind is like a banana tree with monkeys jumping all around. You know, these thoughts that I can't control. Take heart, he says, be encouraged. One of two things is most certainly to happen. The banana tree will either run out of bananas or the monkeys will get tired. It's true. If you commit yourself to prayer, you're, you will either get tired of these thoughts or the thoughts will themselves go away. Like you'll either feel like a thought is coming to you and you're like, I don't want to think about this. And you'll naturally push it away because you've khalas, you've got, like have distaste for thinking about anything and you just want to pray or you won't have any more thoughts. Like, like there, there isn't an endless supply of them. Be encouraged, be encouraged. Distraction is just, is a very normal thing and it means you're on the right track. Keep praying. Another form of prayer is the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer is a very beautiful, very simple prayer. It's just one phrase, Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God, have mercy on me, the sinner, that we can repeat multiple times a day, hundreds, thousands of times a day. You can pray the Jesus prayer everywhere you go and in everything that you do, you, as you're going, as you're coming, right? Which is great, which is excellent. And you can also pray the Jesus prayer alone, in your, in your secret place, in your closet, in your prayer corner. I've only recently, in the last few years, discovered this, that the more you do both, the more union you have with God when you do both. Like it's synergistic. It's not like three plus three equals six. It's more like three times three equals nine. So the general beginner's advice that was given to me and that I, I give to people, but again, review this with your spiritual guide, is to pray the Jesus prayer in your closet, in your prayer space for two minutes and only two minutes, not more, not less. And there's a reason for that. The reason is, is that when you begin to pray the Jesus prayer, immediate, immediately you will find yourself distracted. And the next thing that will go off is the timer on your phone, right? And you'll be like, oh my God, where did the time go? And if I don't feel that it's a scarce commodity, I will allow myself to be distracted for hours. So knowing that I only have two minutes of this prayer with God forces me to, to, to rein it in a little bit. Some people feel that that's too extreme, so five minutes, fine, right? But in the beginning, it's very normal that there be, you know, an upper and lower bound restriction of prayer. The Jesus prayer, so much could be said about the Jesus prayer, but it's enough to say this. This is, you know, enough, enough for today, is that when we call the name of Jesus, it's very different from when we call somebody else's name. Like I just told you a story about my sister, Mary Lise. That's great, that's excellent. But that didn't make Mary Lise appear here and now. It gave you an idea of what her character is like and so on, but it, do it doesn't, it doesn't call the person into presence. When we call the name of Jesus, he becomes present with us. So the most important part of the, of the prayer is the very name of Jesus. Because when we call him, he comes. In all of his reality, he is there, 
present. With all of his power. So that's why the Jesus prayer is so powerful. You can par down the phrase, like if you feel it's very long, Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God, have mercy on me, the sinner. You can, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, the sinner, or Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Or You can take parts out of it if you wish. There's no, you know, no problem with that. The only thing you, you ought really not to take out is the name of Jesus, right? Some people pray the Jesus prayer very simply by just calling the name of Jesus. They're just calling him like, like, like if I forgot my phone here and I walked away, you'd call me, John, just gently, softly, out loud, sit in a position that you're comfortable in, look inwards. You're calling Jesus who lives in, in the kingdom of heaven in your heart. You're calling, you're calling to God who dwells within and call on him. The way, you would, the way you would call somebody, like I was saying, who just forgot something and have just taken two steps away. He's not far. He's at hand. He's near. Another form of prayer is prostrations. Oftentimes, we don't know why we do prostrations. A prostration is very simply this. So we were talking about how prayer can be internal or external. So here's a very external form of prayer. Prostrations are very helpful in, in a variety of different things in spiritual life. Not going to go through all of that, but you can discuss it with your spiritual father, spiritual guide, right? And very simply, every time I kneel down, every time I put my face down to the ground, I'm saying, Lord, I have died with Christ. I have been buried with Christ. And every time I rise again, I say, I am risen with Christ. I am enjoying, I am celebrating, I am living my personal death and resurrection in the life of Christ with every prostration. That's what we're doing. Prostrations are not a penance, like they're not like a, like a punishment for, for sin or they're not, you know, um, trying to please some, you know, some capricious God or they're not, no, 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 it's none of that. It's Jesus has died and risen again and he's invited me to participate with him in his death and resurrection. So I'm participating with him. I'm embracing and I'm accepting and I'm willing to go with him the way, the way of the cross and the way of the resurrection. And I'm enjoying, I'm relishing in that. So generally when we do prostrations, we try, we always try to do them slowly. Same thing with the Jesus prayer. When I first start praying the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ slow down enjoy relish each word relish each movement relish each going down and coming back up again right another beautiful aspect of prostrations is when i do a prostration what hits the ground first usually my nose right not that i have a big nose or anything right um what is the nose like your nose is is in like in like a, it's a literary symbol of, of the personality of the of personhood you know i'm saying lord i'm i've put all of my personhood under your feet i put all of my personhood lord under your feet that it may be you lord who rises again right like don't believe me biggest bang for your buck to change your look is what a nose job right because it just says who you are. What about, Abuna, what about prayer that just kind of comes from within? What about, sometimes we call it open prayer. Open prayer is when you just talk to God and tell him what, tell him what you want to tell him. And God loves that. Look, all of these other forms of prayer are excellent. Don't do them at the expense of this. If this goes by the wayside and you don't spend any more time just being yourself with God, so, something, something's not right. Make sure, make sure there's time for you, there's sp space for you to just be yourself with God. But I'll tell you something, when I spend time just praying, just talking to God, I start off talking to God and then I kind of derail and I start just kind of talking to myself so to keep us from to keep us from like meandering into self-talk here's a very simple very easy small acronym acts acts of how to structure this time of open prayer if you wish 
if you find it helpful. Spend some time adoring God. That's, that's talking to God about who he is for who he is. It's completely not in relation to me. It has everything to do with his goodness, his kindness, the, his magnificence, his immeasurable love, his immeasurable wisdom, and so on, right? Then it's, it's awesome to have some time to confess. It's awesome to have some time to pour myself out before God and to really review my thoughts, my words, my actions, and ask myself why I feel that way and surrender them to God and bring them back, let them, allow them to be realigned back to God. And it's great to have some time of thanksgiving. That's thanking God, which is different from adoration. And then the last is supplication, asking God for stuff. I tell you, the one I struggle with the most is actually adoration. And if you struggle with it, I asked my spiritual father for some advice. He, he, he suggested that I open up Coptic Reader, find the Psali of the day. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And just read it. Or if you like singing, sing it. Or, you know, and use that as a way of, of adoring God, of, of talking to God about how awesome he is simply for who he is. St. Macarius says that when we praise God, we join in the hymn of the seraphim. Like if you see that, that image of Isaiah 6 where his, God is sitting on his throne and he's surrounded by his glory, that's, that's what, uh, what St. Macarius is talking about. Then there's, there's psalmody, right? And um, the, the church has provided us lots of psalmody. There's morning doxology, there's vesper praises, there's midnight praises. Psalmody is pretty much structured very simply in four canticles um, and uh, a psalmody of the day. Psalmody means a praise. So every day there's a different one. So you can pick the one of the, that one of the day if you don't know what to pick. Then the summit of our worship is the liturgy. A lot of, a lot of people feel that the divine liturgy is, is long or is longer than it needs to be anyways. Or, you know, and I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth, it, it could very well be because I'm starting with the liturgy rather than ending with it. The liturgy is supposed to be like the dessert of my prayer life, not the entirety of my prayer life. If the entirety of my nutrition is chocolate cake, something bad's going to happen, right? This is, this is the consummation of my union with God that has been happening all week, you know, if I pray for like two minutes a day, which amounts to by the time Sunday rolls around, you know, 12 minutes, say I pray morning and evening, two minutes, two minutes, you know, each day, right? Then 24 minutes. You know, what makes me think I'm going to stand in the liturgy for two or three hours and like be having this ecstatic, you know, communion with God? I can't, I can't spend more than two minutes in my room praying, right? So... It's what I, do, what I do at home is going to be clearly reflected in my experience in the liturgy. I'm telling you this as a priest. I'm telling, you, I'm telling you it's my reality. If I don't pray all week long, I have a very disjointed and distracted experience, even while I'm praying the liturgy. It's very, very simple. I'm telling you, it's not, there's no trick questions. It's not complicated. It's just, this is, this is the summation of all that's happened all week. So if nothing's happened all week, you can expect not very much to happen during the liturgy. Maybe you will go to the, so, so you'll say, well, I shouldn't go. Look, this is, I'm talking about how to do it right. That doesn't mean that if you're doing it right, you shouldn't do it at all. Look, that's demonic, right? So this isn't, this, you're doing it wrong, so stop praying. No, the answer is never going to be stop praying. The always, answer is always going to be, like, ask God to help me to fix it, to do it right, you know? At the center and the final purpose of the soul which God created must be God himself alone and nothing else. God from whom the soul has received its life and its nature and from whom it must eternally live. My home is God. My place is God. My belonging is God. My purpose is God. The end of all things is God. And in in prayer, prayer is simply that, is having communion with where I belong. Another beautiful phrase, I tweeted this and it 
gained a lot of a lot of traction for as a flame increases when it is constantly fed so prayer may, made often with the mind dwelling ever more deeply in God arouses divine love in the heart it's really simple prayer in my life is like a fire the more I throw wood in it the, the more it blazes it's not complicated it's not complicated and the fire is actually God's love for me that's actually what I'm experiencing in prayer in the art of prayer to encourage you and to encourage me says gaze in the wonder at the great mercy of God towards us sinners a little effort and how great is the result rightly may we say to those who labor work on for what you seek is of true value God is inviting us God is promising us God is calling us God will assure our success. It's all we need to do is to respond to him. All we need to do is to turn to him. All we need to do is as he turns to us, that we also turn to him. The cost benefit ratio is highly in our favor. So let us, let us turn to some silence, to some solitude. It's the best place to start. How to start? Being very simple, being very practical. God is inviting you and he's inviting me already. You don't need to wait for an, a new invitation. Find a quiet place. Close the door, like Jesus says, and sit alone with God. Close the door physically, close the door mentally, close the door emotionally. I am a very big fan of praying often for very short periods of time because it's easy for me to convince myself when I get distracted, I don't need to think about this right now. I can think about this in four minutes. Like I haven't thought about this for 22 years. It's not the next four minutes that are gonna make the difference, right? And I say that to myself, I'm very sarcastic with myself. I can, I can wait, you know? Like you haven't done something, was, the thing is broken in our house or whatever, the front door needs, you know, the, the, the door, thing that makes the door close after you open it, right? Is, is just hanging loose, you know? It's been like that for like a year and a half, right? Now that I've sat to pray, it becomes urgent, right? Yeah, I can wait. It's not the end of the world, right? Right? But if, if, I'm, if I'm planning to spend like six hours in prayer, then like, you know, you think about these, say, well, what if I forget? Well, what if I was, what they? if it's four minutes, it's four minutes. Like it's, it's I'm, I'm going to sit and pray for four minutes. And then in an hour from now, I'm going to sit and pray for another four minutes. Right? Go al and be alone and enjoy silence and solitude with God. Archbishop Anthony Bloom says in Beginning to Pray, lovely book, Beginning to Pray. A friend of mine recorded it as an audio book. You can find it on SoundCloud, Beginning to Pray. He says, most people, when they sit, when they enter into their secret place to pray and they sit alone, most people have the same immediate realization that they're bored. And then they wonder why they're bored. And then they realize that the only person who's here is themselves. So the only conclusion can be, wow, I'm kind of boring, right? <laughs> Hearing an archbishop say that is kind of funny. The next thing is to look inwards. Find a quiet place. God is not out there or in there or here or there. God is, God is dwelling inside of me in this kingdom of heaven that St. Macarius was talking about that is inside of me. I find it very soothing to rest my chin on my chest. All these different physical things that people will tell you about prayer are very personal and you should review them with your spiritual guide. People get, start hyperventilating and hallucinating and you know, so just check with your spiritual guide before you start doing anything extreme. But I find it very, comf very comfortable to just rest my chest on my, my, my chin on my chest and it just brings me to a place where I'm naturally looking inwards and it's restful. Nobody can dispense with inner prayer. We cannot live spiritually unless we raise ourselves in prayer to God. But the only way we can raise ourselves is through spiritual action, for God is spiritual. Remember, Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth. Why? Because God is spirit, he tells her. God is spirit and therefore he's seeking those who worship him in spirit and truth. When we look inwards, the promise is there in Revelation. It says, after these things, I looked and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. God is delighted to open the door of heaven for you and for me, for us to enter in and to commune with him. For indeed, the kingdom of heaven 
is within you. Finally, St. Macarius tells us, the Lord finds rest in the well-intended soul, making it a throne of glory, and he sits on it and takes his rest. Your good intentions, your desire to worship God in the way that is fitting for him. Remember, worship is our declaration to God of his worth to us. So I'm worshiping God in the way that he likes to be worshiped. I'm worshiping God in the way that is suitable for him. Sometimes people say, but, but yeah, but, but I, I don't like that. Well, that's great. Are you doing this for you or are you doing it for God? I'm not doing this to gain favor. I'm not doing this to get, you know, for God to give me this or to solve this problem or to, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing this because it pleases him. To have that disposition to approach him, to have that well intention is so pleasing to God and makes makes your soul the throne of his spirit the place he can come and rest in you glory be to God forever and ever.